Hello and welcome to Tomorrow's News, the news tomorrow, today. I'm Simon Smyman. And I'm Elizabeth Longstaff. We start this broadcast with an unfortunate incident, a correction to our previous broadcast. Keen listeners may have noticed the extremely minor, subtle error, which was the wrong show being played on Cam FM. Instead of your weekly news show, you were greeted with a shale imitation, a fake, a copy news station pretending to be Swen News. We apologise for this error and promise that the perpetrator will be promptly murdered. Our headlines today. We reflect on the heroism of hedge fund managers as they bravely lost billions of dollars to teenagers on the internet this week. New numbers have been invented by leading mathematicians to quantify the UK coronavirus case numbers. We give you the latest on the vaccine conflict between Britain and the European Union with Northern Ireland and the Republic slap-bang in the middle. And in world news, a transcript of a phone call between President Biden and most attractive man alive, Putin, has been leaked to the Swen News team. Our top story tonight is about heroism. Heroism represents the best of humanity, the embodiment of our finest qualities. There's a reason we watch films and read books about heroes, and why no story is truly complete without them. In the last two weeks, all humankind gained a new set of heroes. They're courageous, honourable and responsible. I, of course, refer to the hedge funds, valiantly battling against Reddit's unholy attempts to buy GameStop stock. I'm joined now by Rentim McBelford, manager of one of Wall Street's largest hedge funds. Firstly, could you explain for all those people out there like me who are just too hot to understand the stock market, just what you're up against? What? we're up against here is nothing short of cyber terrorism. These Redditors, these ordinary people, are attacking the very foundations of civilization by increasing the value of GameStop shares that we were clearly betting will go lower. This ain't the first time New York has been attacked and we have been battling day and night in the trenches of finance to stave off these cowards. We aren't alone, of course. We have great allies like Robin Hood, the SEC and Congress. With them on our backs, we will show that we will not be cowed by this financial terrorism. You were, though, very nobly, I may add, betting on the companies to fail, right? Well, of course we were. You know, stuff breaks in our economy. Sometimes businesses are destroyed and people lose their jobs. Boo-hoo, you know, who cares? The whole point is that we are doing everyone a favour by profiting off the dead and the dying. If you stop people profiting off a failure, then how will we ever be able to afford our fifth boat? We know that's not what people want which is why we're defending our rights as free, red-blooded Americans to profit off of misery and fear. Is this attack by Reddit hurting your business? Of course it is. I have had clients in tears on the phone to me, telling me they're selling them on a gas house, that their donation to Yale to get their daughter in is now not possible, that they might have to take up their first job, and in consultancy, for a measly $300,000 a year. The rich are suffering because of these depraved Reddit whack jobs, And it's time they woke up and saw that what they're doing has real consequences for real people. And finally, how do you think this sort of depraved attack could be stopped in the future? The free market is like a savannah. We do an essential job in killing off the dying for the greater ecosystem. Like a vulture eating off one of those uh, stripey things. My firm is a proud defender of this free market paradise. And because of that... We've called for anyone with a Reddit account to be banned from stocks trading and for retail trading by individuals to stop immediately. The free market is too important to let ordinary or, or worse, poor people use it freely. Well, we're, we're running out of time here. Is there anything else you'd like to add? You know, ever since 2008, the hedge fund has been the source of our prosperity. Who can look at the economy right now in any country and honestly say it needs change? We extract value when no one else will. And we allow literally several people to live happy and fulfilling lives with no work whatsoever. If this isn't an example of true heroism, then my business deserves to fail. Rentium at Belford, I just wanted to say you are my new hero. Thank you for joining us today and do call me. Coronavirus case numbers in the UK are at an all-time high. So high, in fact, that a squack squad of leading mathematicians have been forced to invent new numbers to quantify just how high. I'm joined by top mathematician Victor Calculus. Victor, what you're doing is ridiculous, isn't it? Not anymore! 
Well then, look me in the eye and tell me what on earth's been going on. Basically, we ran out of numbers. Sorry, on behalf of mathematicians, that's our bad demand outstrip supply. You know how it is. But we're all good now, and you can call me El Chapo, because I've got some serious intent to supply. Supply what? Numbers two. Bigger, better, faster. Could you explain numbers two? Are they bigger than normal numbers? Sometimes. Imagine numbers are a field. On one side, you have big numbers. On the other side, you have crops. And you're out of crops, so you need to steal some from your neighbour. So you dig a tunnel under the field to raid a rival farm's territory, and you can call me El Chopper because I'm sprinting back through the tunnel to safety with a wheelbarrow full of stolen pesticides. So numbers two are some form of illicit contraband? Yes, you remember the Roswell UFO crash? It was a delivery of numbers two. The US government got to them first and saved them onto a database. You stole them from the US government numbers two database? Aren't you in danger? That's right! You can call me El Chapo because I'm being extradited to the United States later today. What a terrible shame. So how does one make a numbers two? Well, it's quite simple, really. You get the biggest number we know of, and add one. That's it? Well, no, you could add two, but we prefer the simplicity of one. Can you use some numbers two in a sentence? <clears throat> the total number of coronavirus cases has arisen to... <coughs> the price of GameStop shares has risen to... <coughs> and the Fields Medal has been awarded to Boris Johnson in recognition of... Victor? You can call me El Chapo, because I never finished my sentence. Also, I operate a drugs cartel. Wow, that was extremely Victor. <laughs> but shouldn't numbers two be called numbers or something? No, why would they be? You can call me El Chapo, because... Well, thank you for joining us, El Chapo. I can see via your webcam you are being raided by a SWAT team. Good luck on those extradition charges from everyone here at the Swen News team. And now, as vaccine supplies are still being blocked from travelling to Northern Ireland, we have our panel of guests here to discuss the situation with unionist leader Michael Caine, no, not that one, in the interest of balance extremist union leader David Burke and conservative junior minister for Northern Ireland, Sir Robert Union. Michael, do you think the EU is attempting to undermine the Brexit agreement for free trade? I do. I think they're trying to discriminate against us Northern Irish and leave us hung out to dry like it's always been, even with all those subsidies we get so that our economy can function. We deserve vaccines from the UK and the EU, to be honest. And it's a disgrace that these governments think they can treat us this way. But didn't your party oppose the agreement to keep Northern Ireland in the common market? Look, that was in the past. You can't bring up Northern Ireland's past when it comes to the problems of the present. We've moved on here, and the rest of the world needs to as well. Now, David, how do you think this could have been avoided? I think if we'd done what I've been saying from the start, and invade Ireland to claim it for the UK, this would never have happened. We'd all be in the same boat and be able to get vaccinated under a beautiful British flag. As long as the vaccine is made in a Protestant country, of course. As always, ultimately, it's the Catholics' fault. And I think it's time we brought back laws which discriminate against them. I think you're making a good point there, David, but while we all hate Catholics here, you have to remember that Northern Ireland has moved on and our big goal is to secure a future for our country. And if that means we have to put up with a few Catholics, so be it. And, Sir Robert, how will you make sure that the Brexit agreement is protected, whilst also preserving the sanctity of this union, which we all really want to keep for some reason? Ultimately, it's up to the EU to respect us, respect our borders and the Northern Irish. Not that we ever really cared about Northern Ireland as anything other than show that's Paddy's boss, of course. So, our real point of contention here is that the EU are a load of bureaucratic idiots who think that we're not better than everyone else, which of course we are. The big issue, as we all know, is that once the vaccines cross the border into the UK, they become British vaccines, and vaccines are much happier when they're British vaccines than when they're European vaccines, and they might not want to go back. But Sir Robert- what... Now, 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 Michael, don't you be disagreeing with me on this. What would the Queen think? Yes, sir. So, another intriguing panel of guests there, with a very wide variety of opinions. Thank you all for coming in. And now for the other news section, with Olivia Stiffbottom, divorced. She'll be giving you all the other news we didn't want to, but could have. Hello and welcome to the other news. I'm Olivia Stiffbottom. Um, as you may have heard, I'm in the middle of a divorce. Uh... <laughs> Especially single. Ooh. Uh, so, whilst I choose between the couch and the dog, here's a special investigation from our political editor, Winona Johnson. 
Thank you, Olivia. In recent days, tens of young people have come forward to speak out about what they consider a crippling burden on their lives, being related to a Conservative MP. These stories have prompted the formation of a support group, Conservative Relatives Anonymous, to provide help for those people who are struggling. I am joined by a member of the group, though to protect their identity, we have changed their name. Tell me, John, why is this group important to you? Quite simply, it's a chance to be with people who understand the struggle. We have relatives who harm people's lives, especially those of younger people like us and our peers. And it can be a real struggle having to bear those links in everyday life. I didn't choose to be related to who is as much an arse in private as in public. And it's nice to be around people who also can't stand their publicly despised relative. And how did you cope before the group? Mostly it involved petty acts of revenge, like putting chilli powder on Christmas turkey when they came round a couple of years back. I also keyed their car and let their tyres down after they gave me a lecture on why benefits should be cut for the poorest. The group is really helping me make peace with having a truly horrendous relative, though. We have a special section for those related to Home Secretaries, both current and former, because they are especially nasty to be related to. And of course, we have a group for Boris Johnson's children specifically, which is starting to outnumber the main group. Come to mention it, are you a relative? Uh, no, I don't know what you're on about. Thank you very much. Goodbye, now go please. Of course, some people shamelessly revel in the infamy and opportunity provided by a conservative relative. After all, such a relative can land you high-paid jobs in the media without any qualifications whatsoever. This is Winona Johnson reporting on a bunch of snowflakes who won't proudly stand by their families. Winona, thank you. And in all the other news, a man from York has recently passed away from what doctors are referring to as extreme ejaculation. According to doctors, Craig Bailey, 43, experienced an orgasm so intensely pleasurable, it killed him. Um, We have in the studio with us our medical expert, Dr. P. Enos. Hello, Dr. P. Enos. Hello, Olivia. So tell me, Dr. P. Enos, what exactly happened to you? Well, spare no detail. Yes, so he was, as I said... No, I, I mean this. I really want you to... To reconstruct the scene for me, please. Well, right. Uh, as I... and, and the listeners at home, of course. Uh, not just for my sake. <laughs> All right. Well, it's, it's really quite simple. Mr. Bale was at home last Thursday when he induced an orgasm, the intensity of which caused him to enter cardiac arrest. Honestly, it was less a matter of the orgasm itself than of Mr. Bale's underlying heart condition. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Um, but it was intense enough to enter cardiac arrest. Right? Well, I suppose so. I, I mean, this, this, this presumably wasn't Mr. Bailey's first orgasm. Uh, it's safe to assume that, I hope. Um, uh-huh. uh, so, so um, just how intense must it have been? I'm not sure that's something we can really know. Just, just estimate. P, my friend, come on. How many times better was it than the average orgasm? You know, Wednesday evening before bed. Run of the mill. Standard issue. Every day. Well, not every day. Um. In, in numerical terms, how much better was Mr. Bailey's? Well, if I were to hazard a guess, I might say, I don't know, seven times? S- seven, seven times? <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, s- s- <laughs> as in six plus one? Oh, wow, okay. Um. <laughs> okay. Oh, goodness. Um... So, now, if someone at home were to try and recreate this, how would they go about it? I would ask that people avoid engaging in any activity which places their health at risk. Yeah, 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 of course, of course. Um, Yeah, safety first. Uh, so, So tell me, when you found him, was there anything around him? You know, um, 
special paraphernalia. I don't know. Um, lubricants, gels, um, tools. Just anything of that ilk. Did the autopsy uncover anything inside of him? No, not that I'm aware of. He had his heart medication, of course. Uh, 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 and now, should he have called the ambulance before he started doing this? Or, or am, am I all right to wait till afterwards? Oh, well... I think I'll take my answer off the air. Thank you very much, Dr P. Enos. And now the weather with Skylar Flurry. But first, the ad, singular, with Keith. Buy a Gaslight at gaslightbuyer.com. You know you want to. You already bought one, didn't you? No, I didn't. Yes, you did, and you bloody loved it. Um... You decided to buy another one. That's what you told yourself this morning. You were eating mustard on toast and you said to yourself, I'd better make sure I buy another gaslight for my collection. My self-worth depends on it. You said it, not me. That is the kind of thing I would eat. And then you resolved to recommend gaslights to your friends and family. You didn't do that yet, did you? You never keep your promises. But you decided to put things right starting now. You're determined to do the right thing and buy a gaslight. Okay. Yes, I will. Gaslights. Buy yours today. You know you wanted to before they said, and now you want it even more. Buy your gaslights at gaslightbuyer.com. And now we turn to the weather with me, Skylar Flurry. Millions of Britons have been enjoying the snow these last few weeks, sledging, fracturing their wrist at seven times the annual rate, and getting into bullfights with random schoolchildren. But it's not all fun and games. In one town in rural Yorkshire, people woke up shocked and disgusted last week after finding their homes had been blanketed in snow overnight, despite it being well forecast and broadcast on their smartphones. We go to Wensleydale Bagpuss, who is speaking to members of the public in Little Fithering Bottom. Thank you. I'm here in Little Fithering Bottom, a small town like any other. Brought to its knees by almost half an inch of snow this week. Right now, the death toll is at zero, but there's only one way for that number to change, and that's straight to potential national tragedy. The residents of Little Fithering Bottom have found themselves devastatingly underprepared for this week's snow. Abandoned cars and vans have been scattered across this sleepy landscape, like a scene from the 1991 film The Rapture after running adrift in the snowbanks piled three inches high. Grandmothers have been caught short on knitting little winter mittens for their grandchildren, who had begged them for them after seeing Bernie Sanders memes on TikTok. This reporter can only assume that the children's now frigid fingers will soon succumb to frostbite, casting the future of snowball fights into tragic doubt. I spoke to a local resident whose spring garden has been ravaged by the snow this week. Well, it's absolutely unbelievable it is. Who would have thought that it would snow at this point in February, after everything we've been through? I went to harvest my salad leaves and herb garden last Tuesday to find them destroyed by frost. I doubt our community will ever recover from this. There's no knowing what the snow could do next. The death count isn't getting any lower, you know. Oh, I know all too well how these freak weather events can devastate communities. Are your friends and family safe? Thankfully they are. It was touch and go for a while this morning, as little Samantha was seen to be falling down a hill at great speed, but it turns out she was doing it for the fun of it on a Wilco tea tray. People here are too afraid to even leave their homes, worried they'll never be able to return if they get caught in a snowdrift. Sure, they're only a couple of inches tall at the moment, but some of our residents are very short. How could we have seen this coming? Ah yes, despite it snowing every year for the past century, Things like this can be challenging to believe. What are your opinions on the weather reports? Watched it once, said it would rain, it didn't. Tragic. Time will only tell if Little Fithering Bottom will ever be able to recover from this well-predicted and entirely expected freak storm. Our thoughts and prayers are with the victims if there ever end up being any. Back to you, Skylar. Thanks, Wensleydale. As for the following week, expect to see warm and sunny weather across large swathes of the United Kingdom slowly getting hotter and hotter throughout the week as the existential threat of climate change makes itself felt once more, likely to culminate in several of you burning to death before you can listen to next week's episode. Now for the sports with Richard. Many thanks, Skylar. Good morning, I'm Richard Dick. 
For another week running, there were no sports due to a severe outbreak of athlete's foot. It has been found that nearly all sports people do indeed have feet. However, in related news, footballer Alex Nash has issued an apology after travelling to Denmark to engage in conjugal relations with a mink. Nash said in a statement, I'm sorry if my travelling to Denmark put anyone in danger, but that mink was just too damn saucy to turn down. A real minx of a mink. Because of his actions, his team has had to quarantine and his manager has issued a statement saying, what the hell. And finally, former footballer Wayne Rooney has been appointed as head of the Whitney Houston Memorial Foundation. Rooney said he was thrilled to have this opportunity. Mr Rooney said he was uniquely qualified, because not everyone remembers Whitney Houston, but I do. I loved her as a woman, as a singer, and as a footballer. It is at this time unclear what the function of the Whitney Houston Memorial Foundation is. True fans of the news will remember last week Joe Biden was sworn in as President of the United States. As part of his presidential duties, it is customary for Biden to take phone calls with various heads of state to establish new strong working relationships, and to see if anyone else has finished Young Wallander and would like to talk about it yet. As we understand it, these phone calls are held in strict privacy, what being said only being known to the president, the recipient of the call, and Mark Zuckerberg. That is, of course, until now. That's right, we can reveal that an exclusive transcript of the conversation between Presidents Biden and Putin has been leaked to the press by a so far unidentified valuable insider who gave the code name Jeanette. We go to Maxwell Triple Barrel surname for more details. That's right. Once shrouded in secrecy, we're delighted to be bringing you the exclusive transcript of the very first phone call between President Putin and new president on the block, Joe Biden. The two have met previously, apparently becoming firm friends over their shared love of big dogs, electronica and committing war crimes on the DL. This call, however, was set to be different. That is how, through kindness, unity, the strength of our convictions, the grit of the hard-working American people, the spirit of the free cowboy yeehaw, and the love we share for one another, we can pull through this crisis and come out the other side stronger than ever. I would like to extend the hand of the American people forward in friendship to you, President Putin. And I hope we have found strong allies in one another looking forward. Excellently put, President Biden. I am sure we shall get on famously. I look forward to speaking with you very soon about how our two nations can move forward. Uh, Now, if you'll excuse me, I have some business to attend to. Well, it's just that if you have a moment, if it's all right, I was um, thinking about my national debt crisis the other day. You know how it's ballooning? Well, I was just thinking a lot about balloons and how much I like them, generally speaking. Balloons? Especially ones that you might find at a birthday party. Mr. Putin, can I call you Mr.? I wondered if you would maybe like birthday party balloons also. I can't say I've spent much time thinking about them. Uh, No, if you'll excuse me, I really do have some business. It's just that I'm really trying to nail down the people put down as maybes on the Facebook event for my birthday next year, and I see you haven't clicked on going yet. I thought you were maybe waiting for me being president to be official. It's fine, obviously, if you're busy. It's just that I put quite a lot of time and effort into that Facebook event, and I need to get my ratios up. It's Laser Quest, by the way, if you're into that. It's cool, obviously, if you're not. It's like, whatever, but it could be really fun. Oh, uh, sorry. I don't check it that regularly. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. You say Laser Quest? Because I absolutely love it. It goes laser on like this for. Quite some time, I'm afraid. And no hacking the Laser Quest scores to make you win like you did at the G20 bowling party a few years ago? (laughs) I would never dream of it. 
Uh, no, anyway, I, I really should be getting going for real this time. Okay, but you hang on. Uh, well, that was what I just said, yes? No, you hang up. I had... Oh. Truly okay. groundbreaking stuff. We'd like to thank our informant, Jeanette, for their hard work and dedication to breaking the law. In other news, but not the other news, a startling new report has found that 55% of Remainers are actually goldfish in a trench coat. The report claims that, and I quote, the numbers of goldfish in a trench coat that took part in the EU referendum was significantly higher than previously thought. Still with us to examine this salacious revelation is our foreign affairs editor and all-round terrible person, Maxwell Triple Barrel Surname. Maxwell, give me the details. This information comes from a new Ipsos Mori poll, and we understand that no previous pollsters had thought to ask the obvious question of whether or not the respondent is a goldfish in a trench coat. This new poll revealed that 55% of Remain voters were in fact a goldfish in a trench coat, but the true figure is likely to be much higher due to the shy goldfish in a trench coat effect. In fact, analysts predict the true figure to be closer to 105%. What are the political ramifications? It does call into question where the Remain voters knew what they were voting for. What with more than half of them being goldfish in a trench coat. Observers observe that they would have had very little experience of EU bureaucracy. And with their short memory spans, they may have also forgotten that the EU is a satanic conglomeration that wants to ban Lawrence Fox from drop-kicking refugee babies into space. Furthermore, my sources tell me that 20% of Leave voters were goldfish in a Mac. I'm told that they voted Leave because they didn't want to be captured, imprisoned and left to die in a French fish tank. They strongly preferred to be captured, imprisoned and left to die in a British fish tank. Thanks, Maxwell. That private education really shines through. Let's hear from a goldfish in a trench coat who voted Remain, Henrietta Richardson. Henrietta, why did you vote Remain? You didn't want to have to take a citizenship test to decide which country could fish for you. Fair enough. Why the trench coat? Oh. Oh, I, I'm so sorry to hear that. I had no idea. Henrietta, thank you for joining us. And, Maxwell, if what Henrietta says is true, then I have truly lost all respect for you. Now over to the arts with Meredith Hibbertson. Good afternoon, I'm Meredith Hibbertson with the arts. Now since we've been on the air, we've discovered some very disturbing news concerning HBO's hit limited series, Chernobyl. In the last few minutes, an anonymous call was received by our news team, which claimed that the catastrophic nuclear disaster that we've all seen on our TV screens was in fact a real event. In light of the startling implications of this call, we flew out our Soviet Union correspondent, Geraldine Sputnik, who is currently at the scene. Geraldine? Hello, Meredith. What do you see? Well, there's a field. What? I'm in a field, Meredith. I thought you were at Chernobyl. I am. There's not that much here, I'll be honest with you. Coming in, we were stopped by a group of what looked like some armed security guards. But I don't speak Russian, Meredith, so I couldn't possibly know what they were trying to tell us. So how did you get in? Well, we followed a pack of wild luminescent dogs through a back alley, and now we're here. Can you see the explosion? What? The explosion. The Chernobyl explosion. No, no, there's no explosion here. Although I'll be honest with you, it does feel a bit weird. How do you mean? Well, our sound recordist just started growing another set of hands. And that's all the time we have for today. Now, to close off the programme, it's the Rapid Fire News the fastest news delivery service in the country. Scientists show that in spite of what dreams may have you believe, erratically kicking your legs when falling from a great height will not save you. A man remembers that he has forgotten to worry about climate change. Liam Nesbitt, 26, states that he was shocked to look outside and see that it was weirdly sunny for February, before recalling that anthropogenic climate change is ravaging what remains of his sad little life. Nesbitt states that the existential dread was not so much the worry as it was the issue of scheduling it into a busy day of rumination and catastrophizing. Two academics engaged in a spirited debate about a topic that literally no one other than themselves cared about. Dr Jessica McMillan, aged 63, and Dr Alex Lee, aged <coughs> met each other at some symposium at a convention full of other boring professors showing their own pointless research in order to settle their differences over whatever inane topic they've dedicated their lives to. Neither professor managed to change the other's mind, 
nor did they manage to convince the general public that their work was of any value. Anti-racism activists have heralded the success of the new Netflix show, Bridgerton, on account of its race-blind casting. The show's producer, Bon Bon McDuff, said that we are proud to be at the forefront of new social movements and in creating a more equal society by making quality content where everyone is ridiculously good looking, free porn is provided and race is never mentioned. Reports have emerged that the lasagna in Wembley Stadium has overcooked and is on fire. Despite public controversy at the £32 billion expenditure, the Chancellor Rishi Sunak has insisted that the burned cheesy monstrosity will not be distributed as free school meals for starving children because of the government's pre-existing golden ticket scheme service with Clarkwell's munitions. In a statement on his Instagram page, the Chancellor said, The Conservatives are the party of fiscal responsibility, and this investment created hundreds of high-paying, quality, non-unionised jobs, while the Labour Party is going on about silly things like free broadband. And SAGE have released new symptoms for COVID-19, stating that if you are still correcting people's grammar in real time, still playing devil's advocate, or don't regret voting for Boris Johnson, then you should self-isolate immediately. And that's it for this week's news. On behalf of the entire team here at Swen News, we wish you and your goldfish neighbours a good week. Thanks for listening. Good morning. You've been listening to Tomorrow's News on Cam FM. Tonight's production was directed by Jake Rose and Jasper Cresty Hyde, edited by Jake Rose, produced by Vicky Chu, written by Archie Breer, Jonathan Neary, Emily McPherson Smith, James Colhane, Genevieve Bailey Aylin, Andy Bucks, Claudia Vivian, Jake Rose, and Jasper Cresty Hyde, starring Jemima Langdon as Elizabeth Longstaff, Saula Bailey as Simon Smythan, Kitty Beck as Winona Johnson, Joe Folly as Maxwell Trevor Barrel Surname, Barnaby Evans as Wensleydale Bagpus, Ida Rosen as Keith. Iona Rogan as Olivia Stiffbottom, Gabriel Jones as Richard Dick, Aist Miskerte as Skylar Flurry, and Holly Jones as Meredith Hibberton. This episode also featured Thea Rooney as Renton McBelfort, Isaac Allen as Victor Calculus, Oscar Wilson as Michael Caine, Neil Seary as David Burke, me, Jasper, as Sir Robert Union, Katia Allen as Tory Relative, Erin Hudson as Gaslit Adgas, Sophie Braun as Local Resident, Jago Wainwright as Joe Biden, and Ryan Morgan as Vladimir Putin. The music you've heard was composed by Thomas Feel, with additional SFX provided by Zapsplat, Free Sound, and Sound Bible. Good night.